right, hello everyone. Welcome to this HDSA convention session on brain donation for HD research. I'm Leora Fox. I'm the Assistant Director of Research and Patient Engagement at HDSA. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's my pleasure to introduce three speakers who will be talking about brain donation for HD. Uh, from different perspectives. So this is, um, I, I just want to say that this is a topic that um, is, that has a lot of weight. Um, so, you know, pay attention to what you need if you need to, you know, to step out at any time where there, it's definitely a, a sensitive topic and a, a weighty decision. So just, uh, you know, be attuned to yourself around that. We've got lots of uh, opportunities for support at convention. So, um, and I, I want to say that brain donation is really an, an incredible gift. Um, having worked with human tissue myself in the past when I was doing HD research, I know that HD researchers have an enormous amount of respect for this very, very precious resource. Um, they plan very carefully to be able to gain all the knowledge that they can from every piece of tissue. So that said, I'm excited to introduce our three speakers. We have... Uh, 2018 HCSA Human Biology Fellow and Pathologist, Dr. Richard Hickman, who will present some of his findings working with human HD brain tissue. Dr. Sabina Beretta, the director of the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center, and she'll share more about the process of brain donation and explain how people from HD families can approach the decision. And Cheryl Sullivan Staveley will share her experience with brain donation after the passing of her late husband, John, and her daughter, Megan. Um, we can sort of take Q&A as things come in, um, in between speakers, or we can kind of do a panel at the end. We've found that panels are working pretty well, um, depending on sort of presentation length and time, so we can play that by ear. Um, but now I'd like to welcome Dr. Richard Hickman. So today what I wanted to talk to you about, I'm a neuropathologist, um, and so I'm a physician. Uh, I trained in internal medicine surgery in the UK, and I came over here to the United States, and I trained in anatomic pathology, so studying human tissues to get diagnoses. So a lot of that is cancer diagnoses, but we also look at other diseases. Um, and I subspecialized in neuropathology, so really focusing in on the central nervous system, right, so the brain, spinal cord, diseases that affect that. Um, and I went further and really focused down on Huntington disease. And so today I wanted to just talk a little bit about why brain banking is important, I think, for the field, and also talk about some of the uh, findings that we, we uh, discovered um, using a large cohort of brains uh, from, a, from a brain bank at Columbia University, which is where I worked. So first of all, why are brain banks? Why are they important? And then I'll talk about some of the findings that we have from uh, our HDSA Human Biology Project funding. So. Um, there's me, <laughs> you can tell. Um, and this was my mentor on the left, um, Jean-Paul von Sattel. Um, and um, we're at a double-headed microscope here. This is sort of how we train as a neuropathologist. Uh, as, um, he was my mentor. And you can kind of see down here, this is the double-headed microscope. And here are some slides. And that's from a brain that was donated. Um, and we spend many hours looking over each brain to get the diagnosis and other diseases that may be in that brain to get a specific characterization of each patient who passed away. And he really made a very important discovery that many HD researchers um, pay attention to, and it was the neuropathologic classification of Huntington disease. This was from 1985. As many of you know, um, Huntington disease is caused by this CAG expansion in the Huntington gene. And in neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington disease, there's always this certain areas of the brain that are very vulnerable. And in Huntington disease, that area is the striatum, which is here. And what he did, he, through looking at about 163 brains, he found that there's a diversity, a, a sort of spectrum of severity of disease in the human brain at the end of life. Some people have, this is the striatum here. And you can see that from grade one to grade four, it really shrinks down. So some people have really shrunken striata. Other people have less disease at the end of life. And so people are very different 
from one person to the next. And it's that difference that I think is very important to study in human brains. And it was only possible with this study by having a systematic protocol of looking at one brain to the next and having a very standardized protocol to do that. And this was a brain bank paper, and it's been cited now nearly 3,000 times. Um, it's very famous. It's used worldwide. Um, this is where people cite them from, um, North America, Europe, um, places in Africa, South America, China, Australia, even New Zealand. Um, so really worldwide publicity and very important um, for research. Um, so why, why are brain banks important? Um, because it enables a study of the disease in patients, right? Um, uh, it's, you know, hunting and disease only really occurs in people, right? And that's who we're really interested in, the patients, right? Um, and it allows study of the heterogeneity, how people are different. Some people have less severe disease than others. Uh, and that enables the study of modifiers. Why do some people do better than others? Um, also allows for the study of other diseases that may occur with Huntington disease. Allows the, an assessment of response to therapies. Now we have Huntington lowering therapies. We can look at how well people are responding to that at, um, after they've passed away. Uh, and then you can also compare with animal models. So people who work in research labs and they have novel findings, they can then go, well, do we see this in human brains? Is this um, uh, compatible? So brain banks, I think, have three main functions. Um, one is research, right, as we discussed, um, but also um, for diagnosis of the patient, right? So um, you have a clinical diagnosis in life. Do we see that same diagnosis in the patients? Are there other explanations for why there was cognitive dysfunction, uh, you know, um, memory problems in patients? And also for feedback to clinicians. Is there anything we can do better for patients? Was there something we missed? Um, so it's sort of like for audit as well of clinical care. So I'm just going to focus on research. Um, so I started my neuropathology training in 2017. That was five years ago now. It's gone fast. Um, and in 2018, I was very fortunate to get HDSA funding. Um, and brain banking is, is expensive. Um, it really costs a lot of money. And we couldn't have done the studies that we've done without the generosity of the HDSA uh, and also HDF later on, the Hereditary Disease Foundation. And we published a series of studies since then. It takes a bit of time to get research you know, published. Um, but we now have several studies that have come out through um, uh, research on human brains. Um, so one of the first questions I had, um, I mentioned that HD is very different between people. Um, and you'll see here at the age, at expanded CAG of 40, which is on the low end, you can see that there's really a wide range at the age of death. So some patients pass away at 40, some patients pass away in their 90s. And I think it's important we wanted to study, are there other diseases that can occur at later ages uh, in patients who have less severe HD? And so we looked at um, other brain pathologies, so Alzheimer's disease, changes, um, Lewy body disease, ALS. And in our brain bank at Columbia, we had 132 brains, which is of quite a large size. And we found that at the older ages of patients, just like other patients do, it, in older ages, they can develop Alzheimer's disease changes, um, Levy body disease, and we also found ALS as well in a subset of patients with HD, motor neuron disease. So about 20% of, of HD brains also have other comorbid pathologies in their brains late in life. And we looked at another cohort as well, which was much larger, um, 619 brains, and we found, again, about 20% of um, brains also had other diseases as well um, that we should pay attention to later in life. So 
combined, we looked at about 750 brains. That was the size of our cohort, if you look at both. And Alzheimer's disease changes were, most were the most common other pathology that we see in elder, older HD patients. Um, but interestingly, we also found that there was an overrepresentation of motor neuron disease in HD2. Um, six individuals in this cohort of 751 had ALS as well, motor neuron disease. And that's about 150 times more frequent than in the general population. So that was something that was important for us to study. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But just going back to pathologic diagnosis in clinical education and training, I just wanted to just show you one patient who donated her brain. She had a genetic confirmation of HD uh, and um, was diagnosed with HD, but she had severe cognitive decline, so memory disturbance and so on. And this was the brain. This was, again, we're looking at the striatum here. And if you remember the pictures I showed you before, this isn't really severe degeneration of, of the striatum. The striatum is pretty well preserved. It's smaller than you would expect. But you can still see the curve of the chordate nucleus protruding in. And when we looked at, un, under the microscope, we could see there was, compared to this part, there's still some neurons here uh, in, in the striatum. So this was very mild HD, pathologically. But what we found instead to explain the cognitive decline is this lady had amyloid plaques, and all these little dots are amyloid plaques in her cortex in part of the brain and widespread neurofibrillary tangles and tau. So she had, in addition to Huntington disease, severe Alzheimer's disease, which explained her memory problems in life. Um, and that's potentially treatable as well, right? Alzheimer's disease, right? Some symptomatic um, drugs. So just in summary, so we found that there are other pathologies that can occur in patients with HD. Um, typically patients who have lower CAG, um, they have lower grades of HD, and they can acquire other pathologies like other people do as you get older in life. And ALS appeared highly represented in our cohort. Um, we also looked in, on the flip side, do patients with ALS have the Huntington mutation, right, to see if that occurred. And this was a study that was led by the NIH in Bethesda. And uh, we found that about 0.1% of patients with ALS actually have the Huntington mutation. Um, and again, this was a, a partly, this was a large series of samples from patients who donated, ALS patients, so not HD. Um, but that was also brain bank too. We had several brains that we studied under the microscope and found Huntington inclusions in those ALS patients without any other evidence of HD. There was no striatal degeneration in those patients. We clinically had no HD. So it was quite interesting. Um, and sort of is a testament that the gene may be doing other things too, to other diseases. Um, and then finally, there was some recent study that we did um, looking at where are those Huntington clumps in the cortex. We've known for now about 25 years that these clumps exist in patients with Huntington disease. But where exactly are they, right? Um, and how do they relate to the degeneration in the striatum? How does it relate to CAG expansion? And so we looked at 65 brains and, um, that we received, and we did Huntington stains and other stains uh, as well to look at the clumps. P62 is one of them. And we showed that they're much more prevalent at the front of the brain than at the back. So it's not uniformly distributed. There is a, a marked variation in the amount of clumps in the brain, and that may have some significance. Uh, one thing as well we found was that the amount of clumps is really correlated by the size of the CAG. So if you have a larger CAG, you have a lot more clumps in the brain. But it doesn't really correlate with the grade or disease duration. So it may be fairly static in the brain. Again, this is cross-sectional. It's a small study, 65 brains. It's large for a brain bank study, but um, it, the, the findings were, were significant. So just to sum up, I think brain banking is central to HD research. You know, the disease only occurs in patients, right, people, um, not mice. Um, uh, and so, and it offers the opportunity to, to try and understand why some people have less severe disease than others. Um, and 
enables studies of genetics and human neuropathology. Are there any other modifiers um, that explain that, genetic modifiers? Uh, we can measure response to therapies um, and allows validation of findings from the animal models in human, uh, with the human tissues. And also, we can feed back to families about the diagnosis, um, which is very important, and also to health professionals. What can we do better? Um, so thank you for listening. Um, I just want to, I like this photograph. We're, we're all looking at HD from different perspectives, I think. Um, and neuropathology is just one perspective, one part of the bigger picture. Um, and I want to say thank you to the families who've organized brain donation and the patients. Um, it's obviously not possible without all of you. We're all part of the team. Um, here's my email if you want to reach out. I'm now at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, but this was um, when I was at Columbia, the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, um, and these were my mentors here. Um, so, yeah, so thank you very much. Any questions? I think this one, yes, this one should work. Well, okay. thank you for that very clear talk on your work and some of its implications. Um, so I think a lot of the, the questions that are coming in are related to um, the process of donating brains, but someone is sharing a story about um, the information that they got back after they donated brains. So I'm curious, um, and I'm sure others are curious, um, what kind of information you have about the families who have helped to donate their loved one's brain and whether any of that information goes back to them specifically. Yeah. So. Um you know, at Columbia, uh, um, I work very closely with Karen Marder, and uh, some of you may know her. She's a prominent neurologist, <laughs> prominent neurologist um, in Columbia, and uh, so she w we would sort of work as a go-between a little bit. Um, um, but um, uh, and I would talk with her about the findings, and we would go into a lot of depth, sometimes 15, 30 minutes, just going over the report. And then she would talk with the families to sort of, sometimes I can be a bit too technical, and <laughs> I think she's better in that sense of delivering the message clearer. Um, and so that's one way we, we sort of did that. Um, I have spoken with families in the, in the past um, as well, uh, when they had direct questions. Um, but yeah, usually through neurologists, we would get that information back. Thanks. Um, okay. I think that we'll probably have time to have a panel, so. Uh, oh. We'll, uh, we'll bring up Dr. Beretta to talk more about the process of brain donation. I know folks have a lot of questions about that, so thank you. Hello, everyone. I would like to start by thanking HDSA for inviting us and particularly for uh, organizing this workshop. But even most importantly, I would like to thank everyone in the audience, everyone that is listening online and or will in the future to even consider the possibility of brain donation as I will uh, try to go through and as Dr. Hickman has so powerfully um, gone over, it is really a gift of knowledge. It is, each brain is precious because we learn so much from it and so many studies and so many advances in research can be done uh, because of each brain donation we receive um, I think you have seen these slides, so I'm going to start uh, straight with um, what I will be telling you today. So I'd like to introduce you and tell you a little bit about our tissue repository, the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center. It is one of the NIH Neurobiobank sites, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, I'll talk a little bit, although Dr. Hickman has done it so eloquently that I think I can go quickly on that, on why a brain donation is important. And then most of it I would like to focus on uh, how does it work, really the logistics, how do people do it. Um, so let me start with our uh, mission statement. What we do is to advance research on brain disorders. Our brain bank uh, collects uh, brain donations from any type of brain disorders and also from people that are not affected by uh, brain disorders. I'll tell you it in a bit later um, about why that is important. And we do this by collecting um, human brains or brain donations from across the country. 
um, and then distributing tissue to investigators, not only within the US, but across the world, after once we have completely characterized them, uh, done a neuropathology, done a clinical assessment. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are part of the Neurobiobank, so NIH several years ago centralized resources across six different brain banks, including us, and this has brought quite a bit of advantages for both investigators and donors because people can choose which brain bank to donate to, but also investigators can receive brain donations directly through, or request brain don uh, sorry, tissue requests directly through a portal, um, and therefore different tissue repositories can contribute to it, and it makes it a much more powerful um, uh, resource for investigators. Um, methods are standardized so that we are all doing very similar things, and when we don't, we do it deliberately so that we give some range to investigators. And this is particularly important because, as you heard, the number of donors that need to be included in each research project seem to expand as our tools become more powerful and therefore we keep wanting to receive more, more brain donations and need, uh, needing larger cohorts. So again, a little bit about us. Uh, again, we are a national resource. Over the years, we have um, received over 9,000 brains. We have been active since 1978. But of course, we distribute them out as well. So we are continuously trying to repl replenish our uh, repository. Um, we have several thousands of potential donors or that are registered with us. I'll tell you about registration. And we, our organizations allow us to receive brain donation from across the US um, within a very tight window. So I'll tell you why timing is so essential to this process. And again, as I mentioned, we distribute them out not only within the US, but across the world. And this is particularly interesting, important in science, because science is really a global enterprise. We all need to work together. And we kind of leverage each other's work in order to make progress. So this is an older map, but it shows within the span of five years how many brains we had received from each state and how many samples we had sent out. It, it's a bit an old, it was done between 2002, 2002 and 2007, but it kind of gives you an idea of the span and also the international outreach. Um, Dr. Hickman and I have a lineage in common, and this is not surprising. Um, Dr. Von Sattel had a very strong historical ties to our tissue repository. And the founder of the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center was Dr. Edward Bird. Um, and he was a very prominent Huntington researcher, has done extensive research, and in fact got us started, built a brain bank as a brain bank for all brain disorder, but his main interest was really Huntington. And this is why our collection is actually one of the largest, because it got started so early on, and it has such historical ties with research on Huntington. I, I'm going to go quickly through this, uh, because you have heard, but why brain donation? Uh, we could ask, well, there are so many other ways to study brain disorders. You can do imaging, you can do genetic studies, you can do um, animal models, and, uh, in vitro work. The answer is very simple. Brain disorders are so complex and so difficult to understand that we really need to use all the tools that we have in our box in order to really try to understand them. And therefore, each of these approaches need the others in order to make progress. So just to give you an example, human brain imaging is incredibly powerful in telling us not only about the structure of the brain in live patients, but also how different brain regions react to certain stimulus or doing certain tasks. You can assess the patients 
but the resolution, the ability to go down and look at molecules and cells, is not yet possible. Conversely, human postmortem, very complementary. We never see the donors, unfortunately. We only can characterize them clinically postmortem, but we can go down and look at cell by cell, molecule by molecule. So once you put this together and with everything else that we learn from genetic and in vitro models and animal models and clinical, we have a better picture and we can work um, through this. So what can you do with human postmortem? You have heard quite a bit and beautiful work that has been done. You can work on uh, ultrastructure, so electron microscopy that tells you within the cell what maybe changes. You can do look at synapses, so a microscopy, cell protein and expression. Protein expression, there are very powerful methods, so this is actually a bit um, maybe outdated. Um, this, in fact, is a really exciting time for research in brain disorder because there are very exciting and extremely powerful new methods that are coming up. Um, my own group that, uh, has a collaboration with Dr. McCarroll at the Broad Institute at Harvard Medical School using single cell RNA seq and other single cell uh, methods that are really breaking ground in a really important way and telling us information so quickly that we could have only dreamed about just a few years ago. So how does it work? So the first thing I'd like to tell you is about registering. Um, a registration is helpful to become a brain donor, but it's not essential. We will very gratefully accept brain donation from donors and families that are not registered for us. However, um, and you can find information on our website here, and um, I don't know if there is a way to share it more broadly. Um, I'm happy to, to share the link. However, it is important because it is important for families to have a discussion ahead of time. So a registration is just a kind of wish to donate and it's important because we need to work with families in order to make a, a brain donation happen. Um, again, it's not binding, it's not a consent. Um, we will never solicit donations, so we need to collaborate very closely with the family uh, when uh, passing is imminent or immediately after in order to be able to uh, complete a brain, um, a brain donation. How does it work? As I mentioned, timing is of the essence. Um, our tissues, as you know, uh, our body, brain included, starts deteriorating within hours from death. And in order to be able to do research, we need to keep it as intact as possible. So between the donor's passing and the time we need to receive it uh, and prepare it and store it away, we try to keep it as close to 24 hours, better if less, as possible. This means that we can recover, we are located in Boston, as you know, we can recover brain donation from anywhere in the country, but it means within 24 hours we need to be called by the family, screen, do consent, arrange for recovery, have the brain picked up, sent to Boston, either on a flight or driving if needed, dissect it and put it away. To do that, we have a team of really dedicated people. They are on call all the time. You can call us in the middle of the night on a weekend. We'll be there and we'll need to hear from you as soon as possible. So the window for a family to notify us is either very few hours, two, three hours after passing, depending on where, where you're located, or if possible, earlier on. Uh, this is actually Darren Chernicki, one of our clinical liaisons, so he's one of the people that will take calls both during the day and at night. Um, you can call us, it's easy to remember. Um, the director, uh, Dr. Bennett, that succeeded to Dr. Bird, was quick enough to grab one at hundred brain bank, so hopefully it's easy for everybody to remember. Um, so our coordinator will receive a call, will perform a screening process, 
and then eventually we'll review consent with the next of kin. We will then coordinate the whole process. So we try the best we can not to have the family do any work. It, there is absolutely no cost for the family that is related to brain donation. So if the family wants to be involved, we can share more information, but we can also completely take over from that point. And oftentimes, that is something needed because that is a particular difficult time for the family and they have a lot of things to think about and therefore we can take over the process. Oftentimes it seems to be helpful. Uh, this is our building, the McLean Hospital, where the brain bank is. Um, I would like to take a brief pause to tell you really what is the most difficult part of what they do, what we do. It's not picking up a phone at three o'clock at night, it's not um, doing the work is not anything else. It's the times in which we have to decline a brain donation. And this is very difficult for the family. It's very difficult for us. We try not to do it. We try to avoid it at any cost, but there are some times where this is needed. And the most common reasons are um, conditions that would impact the viability of the, uh, the samples for research, safety concerns or logistic factors. And I'll tell you very briefly so that we can pick up on how it works, but just to have an idea that being registered or, or anything, even a consent at times, unfortunately falls through. And um, we do realize that this is hard. We try not to let it happen. We want and we appreciate every single donation. But there are some exclusionary criteria, such penetrating injuries to the head, or a stroke, or a very prolonged time on a respirator. All these, of course, injure the brain, and therefore it is difficult to do research on those samples. We ask a screening whether the donor is positive for HIV, Hep B, or Hep C. We cannot accept a brain donation if that is the case. We have to be particularly careful for prion disease. Um, it's very difficult to diagnose even in life and even more for us, they need to do it in a few minutes. So our criteria are pretty stringent, but it is essential because we would put at risk the safety of the recovery personnel that will um, have to recover the sample, our own safety and that of investigators to whom we send um, the samples. And then, unfortunately, there are some logistic factors. Um, we may have been called too late, or um, there is a snowstorm in Boston, and we, we ask our partners at the Neurobiobank to help, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. Um, we have this funny relationship with Miami. They have hurricanes, we have snowstorms, so we swap favors when this happens. But at times we just can't find uh, somebody to recover the brain or there is no flight. We had a lot of challenges, as you can imagine, during COVID because a lot of flights were canceled and we couldn't um, get a, you know, a brain donation on a, on a plane. When the brain arrives to us, we have to dissect it, and the reason is that we never send one brain to researchers unless there is a very strong scientific rationale. What we send are very small samples, enough to do their studies, no more than that. And it is essential because every brain goes into hundreds of different research projects, each, receive, each investigator receiving what they need. And then we store it away. We both freeze and fix different hemispheres. So we have minus 80 freezers. Um, at the moment, we have 40 of them. We have been told that we better stop going, but we'll see about that. Um, and the next part is really, we need to learn as much as we can about each donor. So when we process the donation, we don't have time. We only have so many hours, so we take as little information as we can, just enough for us to do it. But after that, it is really critical that we get as much information about each donor, both clinical and neuropathological. So we collaborate 
with the families to collect health records. We have a um, family questionnaire. So after about a week from the brain donation, we send out a condolence letter together with release forms for health records and a family questionnaire. And this is information is really critical, as Dr. Hickman, for instance, was saying. If we don't know what else was there, if we don't understand the presentation, the onset, the type of symptoms, it will be difficult to really understand what we are seeing. Our neuropathologist will uh, issue a neuropathology report, so we'll dissect the fixed part of the brain. And this report is always shared with the families and um, it can be shared with other uh, clinicians or family members if the legal next of kin authorizes us to do so. Um, the neuropathologist, uh, same as Columbia, is also available to discuss once a family receives a report, if they have questions, they are open to have a conversation. Once we have everything, health records, questionnaire, neuropathology report, we meet, we discuss each case, we look at the different uh, information we have, and finally we come up with a set of diagnoses. And finally, we send tissue away through, that can be requested through the NIH Neurobiobank portal. And obviously, that's the point. We want to do research. We want to understand better what is happening, what are the changes, what could be the the chain of events within the brain that leads to cell death, for instance. So we went to that, we, we sent it to investigators across the world. We are always um, available to investigators to discuss their applications, and there have been thousands of regional manuscripts that have been generated um, with these uh, samples. And the last thing I want to mention is we are grateful for brain donation from people that are not affected by brain disorders. And this is because in order to understand what changes happen in the brain of somebody with Huntington, we need to compare it with people that are not affected. So studies are all, almost always designed with a comparison group, people that were not affected by brain disorders, and people that did it, did so in, for instance, had Huntington. Without it, we can't really have a s robust study. And this is something that I mentioned because a lot of times families will say, I wish I could also be a brain donor, but I'm not affected. Actually, that donation would be just as precious. And with this, I would like to thank all the tissue donors and their families. Um, needless to say, without their generosity, research on Huntington on postmortem would not be possible. The Neurobiobank, of which we are one of the uh, repositories, and of course you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Beretta. We actually do have quite a few questions about the process of donation, and so maybe we can address a couple of those, and, and then we'll have Cheryl, and then, yes, and Cheryl will talk about it as well. Um, so, oh, and there's more coming in. So I think some of these were answered. I did put the link in the Q&A uh, to learn more about brain donation, and that's where the actual forms to fill yes. out can be found on the, yes. on the website. Um, uh, someone's wondering if you participate in a therapeutic study, um, for example, uh, an, a viral study like the Unicure study, um, can you still donate your brain tissue? I believe so, yes. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, those uh, people that participate in studies are of particular interest, particularly to the groups that either run those studies or um, plan to look at the effects. So in other words, once they have done a particular treatment, can we see a difference at the level of cells and molecules? So, so absolutely. Thank you. Um, someone's wondering what is considered prolonged time on a respirator? That is a very good question. It's a bit of a getting into the weeds, and I don't know how easy it is to hear, but um, we 
try to keep it within two, three hours. However, sometimes people breathe over the respirator, so, so they, are, they will be on a respirator, but they're actually breathing on their own. They, have, they are on a respirator just in case they can't. That means that the brain is better oxygenated, so we can prolong it by a few hours. So, so there will be one question that we'll ask either the families or um, if we can, a nurse or a caregiver. So if the person was on a respirator, how long and whether they were breathing over the respirator. And something that I sort of tangentially connected to this that I should have mentioned is the first call to us can be made by anyone. It could be a nurse, it could be a clinician, it could be a social worker. Eventually, we need to talk with the legal next of kin, so either the executor of the state or one of the family members, and there is a sort of a ranking, so the spouse or parents or siblings. or. Um, but we don't need to, to talk with the legal next of kin for too long. Those are usually the people that at the moment are the ones that are really in the worst time of their life. So if we are called by other people, that's fine. We just need to have five minutes with the legal next of kin, with the family, to take the consent. After that, we can take over. Thanks. I will ask one more. So there's a couple of people who are wondering what happens to the person's body after the brain is harvested. So where does it, where does that happen? Does the family receive the body back and um, for somebody provide an example of um, their husband wants to be cremated but wants to donate the brain, is that still possible? Everything is possible. So we don't take the body, we have the brain removed, but it can be done in a way that the uh, brain donation, I think Cheryl will be able to talk about that. A brain donation is compatible with an open casket uh, funeral with organ donation, with cremation. Oftentimes, the recovery is done in funeral homes when they have facilities that are appropriate for recovery, or other times they are done in pathology departments, in hospitals. But after that, uh, we don't need anything else. So, or if it is a, the person was also an organ donor, it will also, um, uh, be part of the organ donation, but we'd never take the body. There are times in which if the body was in a, say, a funeral home that cannot um, accommodate a brain donation, it will have to be moved to another facility, we'll take care of it, we'll pay for transport, we'll pay for transport back to the funeral home where the family wanted the donor to be. Um, so if there is transportation, we work with it, but eventually the body will be where the family wants it. Does that answer? Yes, I think so. Thank you. All so right. let's give her another round of applause. And I'm going to get uh, Cheryl's, yeah. Cheryl's got a slide or two. We, there will be a panel and I can also be around later if people have questions, so feel free. I am hoping that we'll have a little more time to chat afterwards and ask some more questions. Um, but next, I'd like to welcome Cheryl Sullivan Stavely, uh, who's going to speak about her personal experience. Hi, everybody. I'm Cheryl. Um, I want I asked Leora to put these pictures up because I feel like um, with Richard and Sabina at kind of clinical, but just to show the human side of um, brain donations. Um, I have two, um, my first husband, John, was diagnosed by Dr. Edward Bird um, in 1989. Um, we have two daughters, um, Caitlin was born in 81, Megan in 87, sorry. Um, and so they were two and eight at the time when John got diagnosed. Uh, we had uh, g had been given a lot of misinformation and didn't wasn't sure that Huntington's disease was really in the the family. <clears throat> um, and so I am the only person in my family that will never get Huntington's disease. So it made it even more um, imperative to both John and my daughter Megan 
to donate their brain. In life, they participated in many clinical trials, and in death, this was their, their wishes. Um, John, in 1996, was one of 12 people in New England that underwent a fetal pig tissue transplant. They injected fetal pig tissue into one side of his brain to see if the fetal pig could take over all the lost, you know, or the damaged brain tissue from Huntington's disease. Um, that clinical trial was sponsored by Boston University, um, Diocrin and Genzyme, um, and other hospitals, Boston Medical Center um, in Boston. And they had asked John, at the, upon his passing, would he consider donating his brain back to Boston Medical Center or Boston University so they could analyze his brain, you know, post um, the fetal pig tissue transplant. Um, John passed away in 2008, but it was very important to him to do that. Um, somebody a couple of weeks before John's passing from BU, a social worker came out. I filled out paperwork. Um, it was pretty simple. And, you know, they gave me a card with a number to call 24-7. Um, um, John passed away on the, the morning of uh, Monday, September 15th in 2008. And um, I am a retired nurse. John was at a, a nursing facility at Tewksbury Hospital in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. So we were fortunate that, yes, we only lived an hour north of Boston. Um, and I think within 10 minutes of his passing, I was just so focused on, I have to make sure that I call and that the, you know, so that nothing impedes his brain donation. And any of the nursing staff would have gladly called, you know, the number for me, but I was so focused. No, this has to be me. I'm being the boss and just, I guess, being a retired nurse. So I called. Um, a lovely gentleman said, okay. Um, within a short time of John's passing, uh, this, this gentleman, you know, from BU was the first person I called, and then the nurses had called the funeral home. So within a short time of John's passing, his body was brought to the funeral home, and um, the man from BU and the funeral director you know, contacted one another, and yes, the funeral director said within um, a couple of hours that the pathologist from Boston University was there um, at the funeral home, um, and that, you know, he removed um, John's brain. Um, the funeral director really made sure to, you know, emphasize to me with what care and dignity and respect that John's brain uh, was removed. And I just want to reassure everybody, you can totally have an open casket. Um, there was no hint of, you know, anything having been done. John's head was not disfigured in any way. And um, like I said, except for the people that knew that he donated his brain, nobody else um, would know. Um, again, there was no cost at all to us, and um, within a few months, I got a, an autopsy report from Boston University, um, and they, you know, referenced things in regards to the fetal pig tissue transplant and just other things that they had found um, also in John's brain. Um, but I have to say, overall, that the process, you know, for John, I had a very good experience uh, with them. And so when Megan, who had juvenile HD, um, in February of 2014, she was at a nursing facility in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, she started on hospice, and she said, you know, and we had known all along that she wanted to donate um, her brain. And so I'm going to tell you, uh, don't do as I did, do as I am telling you to do. So again, I knew 
Megan wanted to donate her brain. Um, and about a week before she was passing, I kept thinking, okay, I really need to get on and to register her. And, but I still didn't do it. A few days later, um, she became unresponsive on a Friday morning. And um, my second husband and I flew over to the nursing home, and I remember, you know, after talking to the nurses, seeing to Megan, I just said to Kevin, oh my God, you have to go on to the Harvard McLean, you know, brain bank, please register Megan. I, you know, I will feel horrible if something, if I didn't do this in enough time, and I should have done it in a more timely manner, and I should have known better being a nurse, but I was just totally being Megan's mother. And um, because we did know, you know, it seemed that the end was very imminent. Um, so Kevin went on, he registered, you know, he did what he had to do. And I know I made him call later on, a couple of hours later, just to make sure that they got the information because I didn't want anything uh, to happen. Um, Megan did wake up for the next couple of days, but I told her everything is all set, and she said, good, mom, you know, because you know that's exactly um, what I want. Um, Megan passed away um, at 1.15 in the morning on Monday, <clears throat> May 12th in 2014. And again, within a very short time after Megan's passing, um, I went out to the nurse's station and, you know, I said, okay, I have the 24-7 number. Again, I insisted on calling. I talked to this nice gentleman. And what he did then was to fax over the permission as the next of kin. So I think there was two pages. All I had to do, you know, was sign my name, put my address, and you know, the nurses took care of the faxing, but as soon as we hung up, he faxed, you know, the paperwork right over. Um, again, we had called the funeral home. So within a half hour, I probably had signed the papers. Um, the funeral director came to get Megan's um, body. And again, within three or four hours, the pathologist was at the funeral home and he was, it happened to be, he was the same pathologist that had removed John's brain and he remembered that because the funeral director had said, you know, oh, Megan had juvenile Huntington's disease and the gentleman said, didn't I do her father a few years ago? And again, the funeral director said that this pathologist couldn't have been, you know, more respectful, it, again, very dignified, you know. Um, and when the funeral director told me this later, it, it gave me such a sense of peace and comfort and also the fact that he remembered and, and he said to the funeral director, wow, you know, father and daughter, and it just... Um, but that, that will stay with me, you know, forever and to just show, again, what, how respectful and dignified, you know, that the process um, is. Um, just as you said, Sabina, within about a week of Megan's passing, um, I received a lovely letter, you know, from the McLean Harvard and and they just said, in a few more days, we're going to send you, you know, a big packet because we will need, you know, further information. And I almost feel like it said, like, you know, if you're able to fill this out within the next, you know, two or three weeks, we would appreciate it. But it was still, you know, take your time. But again, I knew it was really important and I wanted to be able to get the information. Um, and again, Megan's wake um, was an open casket, and again, there was no way that you could know that she had um, donated um, her brain. Um, <clears throat> and just as you also said, Sabina, filling out the forms, yes, I was able to list who else 
besides myself that I would like, you know, to receive um, the reports. And so I put her, you know, local neurologist, Dr. Sam Frank in Boston, um, her previous neurologist, uh, Dr. Diana Rosas at Mass General, and um, also, obviously, uh, myself. Because Megan had been in a healthcare facility in the nursing home, um, they had forms then that they filled out, but I just had to sign a release form, you know, to give permission for Lowell Healthcare Center to, you know, fill out what they had to do. I filled out the questionnaire and again sent the same release form to Dr. Frank um, and Dr. Rosas. And um, again, I never, you know, felt pressure and everybody, all the correspondence, and I know a couple of times I called over to Harvard, and again, everybody was very kind, caring, um, and respectful. Um, probably it was about at, at the end of September, so about four months after Megan passed, um, I got another, you know, very thoughtful letter from uh, the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center um, thanking me and explaining, you know, okay, we have already dissected, you know, some of Megan's brain. Most of it right now will stay, but we will be sending out, you know, samples to, and they listed various, you know, um, facilities or labs and what it would be used for. Um, and that just was, you know, I really appreciated knowing, you know, okay, well, where was this tissue going? And, you know, um, obviously into looking into Huntington's um, research. And again, they, you know, um, assured the confidentiality and again, the just dignity, you know, and um, respect. And I can say, Receiving that letter and just, you know, reading the autopsy report a little bit, yes, because I'm a nurse, I found it interesting, but also it just made me so proud of Megan as well as I had felt, you know, for John. But again, to me, both times the process was very simple. Um, as Sabina said, no cost incurred to me at all. Um, and everyone involved was as helpful as they could be. And I did not feel like it interfered in any way with my grieving process or doing, you know, what I had to do. Um, and that it, it really could not be easier. And I guess the best thing to know that I fulfilled John and Megan's, you know, wishes to have their brain um, donated. and. And um, when it comes my time, I definitely also want to donate my brain because, as you said, how important it is to have unaffected people, too. So thank you so much for letting me share my story. But I guess I just want to reassure those, if any of you are kind of on the fence and don't know, just please, I hope you take, you know, my very um, positive story and... Maybe that will sway your decision. But again, thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was a really beautiful story, and I uh, hope it will be inspiring for some. And I'm, I'm sure you'd be willing to talk to folks who want to learn a little bit more about your experience. Um, I am looking through our Q&A and seeing um, some more questions about logistics. Um, I can pass around also, uh, maybe our speakers can come, can come back up. We don't have to do the chairs necessarily, but. Let me grab an extra mic. Um, so one thing that I hear pretty frequently when I speak with families about just the possibility of brain donation, um, and somebody has has shared this here. Um, is really a question about some of those logistic factors that Sabina mentioned. So whether there's anything that families can do about those kinds of logistics factors. So someone shared that 
they feel like they did everything registered, called quickly, but then it just wasn't possible. And I've heard from folks in different parts of the country who um, have shared stories like this. And so I know that folks wonder whether there's anything that, that they can do about that or if there's just stuff that will be out of, out of their control. Unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work. And, um, you know, we try working as a team with the family, with the pathologist. Um, calling us ahead of time helps us when we think passing is imminent, gives us kind of a, a, a head start so we can start looking for logistics, for pathologists, for, um, for transportations. Um, with all our best intention and the help of the family, sometimes things will fall through. And um, But the best way to try to make it work, and again, it happens, but we try to avoid it as much as possible, is to work as a team. So work with each other and try to help each other as much as possible. There are sometimes things that the family can do for us if they want to. At times the body may be in a medical examiner office and it's easier for the family to ask the medical examiner to release it uh, rather than us. They won't take our requests, but they will take the families. There are some times in which there are no flights or no pathologists or no drivers and we try the best we can. We are at the moment as a new biobank in the process of doing this huge project in trying to expand our pathology network. We share the McDoss brain banks so we can help each other. Um, we are in the process of trying to expand it so that we don't get into a situation in which we can't find somebody. But I, all I can say is we, we really care for every donor, every family, every donation is precious, and we really do our best. Uh, we do welcome feedback, so if, you know, later on, if things were not working the way you would have liked, um, give us a call, let us know. There is always ways to make things better. Thanks for talking about that tough subject. Um, we have some questions about other brain banks. So someone's wondering whether there are local brain banks affiliated with local hospitals, um, whether there are other brain banks, and I, I know you spoke a little bit about the uh, NIH Neurobiobank, uh, all the, diff the six different sites, I think, that were mentioned. Um, I didn't, for example, see Columbia on there. Um, and uh, and you work now at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Is there a brain bank associated with that? So maybe Richard can speak a little bit to that, and then okay. Sabina as well. Yep, sure. So um, yeah, Columbia, uh, as I understand, still now is not part of the NIH Neurobiobank. Um, so I think um, brain banks, are, as you can imagine, are quite different from place to place. And um, Columbia is quite centralized, so. Um, they have their own way of doing things. Um, when it comes to um, brains that come through there, they're typically seen, uh, those are patients that are seen at Columbia that are typically uh, sent, but w with our HD study, we were accepting um, brains from across the country. Um, and sometimes we would also, I mean, during COVID as well was very challenging for us. Um, we were able to accept um, brains that were formal and fixed. So sometimes um, if we can't get fresh brains, you know, direct within 24 hours, we could ask the brain to be placed in formalin, and that preserves it. And then we could still get the brain and process it and get a diagnosis. So we would still do that. Um, as for other brain banks, I'm not sure how they work, but it, it's all a little bit different, um, yeah. Add a uh, bit can, to that. I can yeah. add a little bit about it. So, um, as Richard mentioned, there are, there are actually many different brain banks in the country. The U.S. is actually quite unique. Um, other parts of the world don't have as much um, in this way. Um, some work very, very locally. 
So they will only take patients that they have been following or within their, um, their hospital reach. Some others work across the country like us. Um, so it is really the family's choice to, to donate, to choose the, the bank where to donate. Uh, most brain banks um, will work relatively locally. So if you choose a local brain bank, um, y y the, the body would have to be nearby. But there are several, both, there are four, four of the six neuro uh, neurobiobank sites work, work across the country. Um, others, such as Columbia, can do that as well. So it, the advice that I would like to give is sort of do a little bit of homework. Um, if a clinician that followed um, a potential brain donor has access to a brain bank, perhaps that's a good choice, or maybe that's a good choice to discuss it with a clinician. If you have a particular interest in a, in a brain bank, or you know other people that donated there. So looking into it and kind of asking the clinicians and um, kind of doing the work ahead of time will help. Thanks. I've got one more question here. I think we've addressed most of them, if not all. Um, the question is, if people are signed up as organ donors, for example, if you know if you have a driver's license, you get asked to to, to be an organ donor. Uh, what's the relationship with this and and a brain bank? Does the brain bank also receive these organs? Is it a completely separate thing? It, they are separate. So we work with several different organ procurement organizations, and it's actually a very um, efficient, collaborative um, way to do it. Um, the brain, obviously, is for research. The tissues that are collected by the organ procurement organizations are for um, for transplant. But we work together, and oftentimes, um, OPOs or um, organ procurement organization will do the the recovery for us. So once they have done. Um, and taking the organs for treatment, they will eventually take the brain and we will arrange for transportation. So the two things are perfectly compatible and in fact sometimes it works really well. And I'll ask one last question which is related to a story I guess that somebody is sharing um, uh, in terms of, of donation. Oh, I think I did address that one. Well, I guess the, the last question I'll ask is, um, do you have any advice for people who are thinking about this in terms of speaking with their loved ones about this desire? So maybe Cheryl. Maybe Sorry. Cheryl. Sorry. <laughs> Again, in our family, um, it was a pretty easy discussion. And as I said, John <laughs> was diagnosed by Dr. Bird, you know, way back in 89, uh, by um, Dr. Bird at Mass General. So um, even early on during John's appointments with Dr. Bird every six months, you know, um, he would just mention how important brain donation was and, you know, what the purpose of it and everything. So that already planted the seed and so we long had that discussion. And like I said, then because of John doing that fetal pig tissue transplant and how important it was to be you. And so it just kind of turned into, you know, a family discussion and that's how Megan knew that she would like um, to do the same. Um, so I guess it was helpful that it was broached to us first, you know, by Dr. Bird and um, to plant the seed. So. You know, maybe if you are thinking for your loved one, even if the, you know, clinician or no one on your team um, talks about it, um, if you think about it and just start, you know, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Certainly, you don't ever want to force anybody, but just, you know, gathering information, talking about it from time to time, seeing how they feel, and just, you know, emphasizing how important it is. Um, for research, and to me, that would just be a good way to introduce the subject and just kind of keep it alive from from time to time. 
I just wanted to add that um, it, it is always possible to call us. So if there is a discussion in the family and you know questions come up that you know you don't know the answer, um, call us. We are always happy to discuss it, to clarify things, to to uh, explain how it works. Um, as I mentioned, a registration is not a consent, so you know you could be registered in different brain banks and choose at some point um, which one will work and which one you feel closest to. But please do reach out to us and talk with us and ask us questions. So there is quite a bit of information on our website, but our site, as much as everybody else's, will always be happy to share information and discuss with you any concern you might have. So just for the benefit of our folks who are listening in online, I'm going to repeat the question, which is if, if you've decided now that you want to register as a brain donor, um, how do you get that process started, and can you do it right here at my convention? I don't have a registration with me, but I can show you where the website is. And So yeah. a registration is easy to do. You do it on your own on the website. You call the generic number, or you can get onto our website and fill it in directly. You don't even need to call us if you prefer not to do it. Um, I don't know if there is a way to show the website here, but uh, so um, I. Megan, sorry. When you know my daughter was passing. And like I said, the nursing home called and said, she's un unresponsive, come right now. And when my husband and I went up and he just was right on his laptop and just registered right then and there. It took him five minutes and this was only three days before she passed. Pardon me? Oh, it won't, it won't show. Right, and that's why I was saying, don't yeah, do as I do, right. as as I did, waiting to the last minute. Sorry, I didn't follow that. Right, right, right. Oh, no, right, it was too different. But with Megan, it was at the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center. And like I said, we waited basically till three days before she passed to register her. But again, it still all worked out very that's smoothly. Yeah. Also, granted, we live only an hour north I of Boston. But, it, yeah. but Kevin, he was the one that did it, but he said it was a very easy process. They gave us the 24-7 number to call, and, and, and that's then what I called. Could you have she passed. So this is only our site, of course. Uh, I can only speak for ours. So other sites may have it different. But this is our home page. Um, if you go here, um, you can you can just um, open this form. Oh, sorry, I don't know where my mouse is. Um, this. With that, you fill it directly. Um, otherwise, you can call us, and that's our registration form. So you can fill it online and send it, and then, sorry, and then we will send a confirmation. But again, I I want to make sure to uh, this is our site. Uh, it is possible to to register with our sites, part or not part of the NeuroBioBank. The point here is not to invite people to come to a specific site, but just to invite you to consider brain donation. Yes, and if you uh, attend, or if you see someone at an HDSA Center of Excellence, there may be, um, they may have information about that specific site, but many of those will direct you to the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center, which it's not the only site, but um, it's definitely got a, a major interest in history in HD. 
So let's thank all of our speakers once again. Thanks.